Open the pod bay doors. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wild away. Six. Fifty-six. Thank you, and thank you to everyone here at the Coolidge. This is a beautiful theater. Thank you for inviting me to participate. It is the 75th anniversary of Ball of Fire. It came out in December 1941, so that's exciting. Um, this movie has a special place in my heart, uh, and I love talking about it, uh, but I'll try to keep it uh, short. Um, it's definitely the only Hollywood movie that has ever had a slang lexicographer as the hero. <laughs> and there he is trying to figure out uh, different bad words for people, including drip and drool and droop and meatball. Um, so it actually portrays how a lexicographer might actually go about tracking down slang in its natural habitat. Oops. There it is. Um, so we have Gary Cooper as Professor Bertram Potts. Um, and he realizes he needs to update the slang entry in the encyclopedia that he and his scholarly colleagues are working on. And that gets him in, you know, mixed up with uh, the nightclub singer Sugar Puss O'Shea, that's Barbara Stanwyck, and hijinks naturally ensue. So, um, before Professor Potts went looking for slang, the screenwriters needed to. So, the screenplay was written by the duo of Billy Wilder and Charles Brackett. Wilder and Brackett were really a study in contrasts. You had Wilder, the Australian Jewish immigrant who fled the Nazis in 1933. He came to America already armed with a, a great love for American uh, pop culture, music, and language. Uh, but his mastery of English at that point was uh, still a work in progress. Uh, Brackett, on the other hand, that's him on the right, he was an East Coast patrician, educated at Harvard Law, uh, and he was the drama critic for The New Yorker before he uh, worked in Hollywood. So they made quite a team, and you know, they won Oscars for the screenplays for The Lost Weekend and uh, Sunset Boulevard, which Wilder, of course, also directed. There's another picture of them. So in 1940 or so, after their success writing the uh, Greta Garbo movie Ninochka, uh, Samuel Golden hired Wilder and Brackett to write a Gary Cooper vehicle. So Wilder had various ideas, and he ended up dusting off a story that he had originally written while he was still in Berlin, and that was called From A to Z. And it was about a linguistics professor uh, who gets involved with a burlesque queen. He had this idea, he, you know, he'd been working on it in German before it got um, translated into, into English. Uh, Samuel Goldwyn liked it, or his wife did, apparently, which was good enough. Um, and so, and then they got Howard Hawks to direct, and um, so Wilder and Brackett then had to make this script, and they realized they had to infuse it with colorful slang of the day. So where did they go to look for this slang? According to uh, one biography of Wilder, uh, he headed down to a drugstore on Sunset Boulevard, where students from Hollywood High School would congregate and drink sodas. And supposedly, after he approached, quote, nubile and tight-sweatered high school girls to learn their slang, he was almost arrested on a morals charge. Okay, that's one version of the story. There are many, many versions of, of this. Um, so in another biography, um, Wilder is quoted directly, and he says he did the field work with Bracket um, at the Westwood Soda Fountain, and they would sit for hours ordering sodas and listening to the students talk jive until apparently they had to cut back on their chocolate soda consumption. <laughs> now that's a great idea. I love the idea that they were down there at the soda fountain shop. That would be a good place to listen for youth slang. And actually the closest uh, soda fountain shop to Hollywood High School would have been the Top Hat Malt Shop on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, you movie buffs might know that was where a 16-year-old Hollywood High student named Lana Turner was discovered in 1937. Uh, 
Some claim it was actually Schwab's pharmacy, but that wasn't it. This is it right here. This is Lana Turner in, um, in that very malt shop where she was discovered in 1937. And, um, and so, you know, it was a, a kind of an already an iconic place, I suppose, in Hollywood for young people to congregate. Now, before the movie premiered in December 1941, newspaper articles gave some more details about Wilder and Brackett's research. Um, this article is from the Washington Evening Star, and it mentions their chocolate soda expenditures. $8.30 would buy you 70 sodas and for the high school students? Okay. Uh, but it keeps going. It also mentions a visit to the Hollywood Park racetrack. Apparently, they spent $116 on bets while they were getting slang at the racetrack. And then there were swing joints, pool rooms, baseball games. Um, and as you'll see in the movie, the field work, as reported in the papers at least, mirrors the research that Professor Potts himself undertakes in the film. After the movie came out, even more colorful details emerged. Here's an article in the Omaha World Herald that explained that Samuel Goldwyn had hired one Muggsy Myers as a technical advisor on the film because of his knowledge of slang from the pool halls and racetracks. And it gives this you know, very colorful backstory about Muggsy Myers and, and all the different uh, careers that he had before landing this Plum Hollywood gig. And then it goes on to give examples of him talking in slang. And then it gets translated uh, into standard English. So you know what he's saying. Um, so the slang in the movie, obviously, it attracted a lot of attention at the time, uh, thanks to Goldwyn's publicity efforts. So the December 15th, 1941 issue of Life magazine, um, Ball of Fire was there as the movie of the week. Um, I should note you know, that this is right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So um, movies might not have been the first thing on people's mind, but again, it might have been a good uh, diversion at the time. So uh, the Life magazine spread, had lots of pictures. Here's a nice one with uh, Professor Potts colliding with chorus girls on his way to visit Sugar Puss O'Shea. But then the, the Life magazine article also had a list of slang terms. <laughs> and this was typical in the reporting on the movie. And we can see, if you look at these, it's an interesting mix, right? We can see some terms that are still recognizable slang. Uh, futzing around, that's actually from Yiddish, literally means farting around. Um, dig me, screaming memes, chicken meaning cowardly, those are all recognizable. But then you get the more peculiar terms, patch my panty waist, a term for ama of amazement. Hoy toy toy, a wonderful time. Cut the mankankas, stop talking nonsense, squirrel fever, romantic urge, and so forth. So. Um, one that life doesn't even mention is my personal favorite from this movie, and that's um, Amici to mean telephone. And you'll hear Sugar Puss O'Shea explain to Professor Potts that an Amici is a telephone on account of he invented it. Well, Don Amici had portrayed Alexander Graham Bell <laughs> in the 1939 biopic, and here we have the entry in Green's Dictionary of Slang. This is compiled by the slang lexicographer Jonathan Green. This is from the online edition of his dictionary, and you can see that the film script is the very first citation given. Now, when slang hunters uh, today go looking for examples in print sources, they can take advantage of a huge database of digitized books, newspapers, and magazines. And if you look in the newspaper databases for some of the more unusual slang from this movie, you'll notice something a little unusual. Uh, a little peculiar. So here's an article from the Des Moines Register from two months before the movie came out. And we can see, again, Amici, we've got Hoi Toi Toi. But notice that they're called examples of 1941 slang as spoken by the high school kids and others, and it never mentions the movie that's coming out in two months. A little suspicious. Here's another suspicious one from the Cleveland Plain Dealer in November. Here we have a columnist claiming that he learned this slang when he dropped into the cabin club, apparently some club in Cleveland, where the younger generation dishes out jitterbug slang and steps with the same fluency. All right, what's going on here? <laughs> um, there's no mention of the movie in this, in this piece either. So it looks like what happened is that Goldwyn's people were planting stories in advance of the movie's premiere to drum up interest 
Not only that, it looks like they were trying to legitimize the slang that's in the movie so that people would accept these words as genuine. It's like, oh yeah, I read that in the paper. That's what the kids are saying. <laughs> so genuine, were they genuine though? That's, that's what I started wondering about. The more I researched this, the more questions I had. I mean, I, I've always loved this movie, but I never really thought about, well, you know, did they really, could they have made any of this up? Is that possible? Well, I mean, some of the terms are clearly genuine slang that was used at the time, but, you know, the, the more I looked for things like call on the Amici, cut the Mankinkas, hoi toy toy, patch my panty waist, squirrel fever, I couldn't find any evidence before these articles that sort of magically appear in late 1941. So this, this got me worried, and I kept looking for some sort of evidence, one way or the other, that would sort of help me out here. Um, it was kind of shaking my faith. And I found a smoking gun um, in Brackett's diary, which was recently published in book form uh, under the title, It's the Pictures That Got Small, that great line from Sunset Boulevard. Check out these entries from early 1941. At the time they were working on it, it wasn't Ball of Fire yet. It was still the working title from A to Z. February 24th, at Goldman's all day, most of it searching for the right slang word for our professor to read. March 1st, at Goldwyn's all morning, arrived finally at a slang word for the picture which satisf satisfies us both. Hoi toy toy. They made up hoi toy toy. <laughs> and maybe they made up others. It's an open question and, um, you know, it, it, it's, it still, you know, deserves further research. And, but, but we can also question this field work that they supposedly conducted. Because if you look in this book, and you're welcome to, to page through, this, this just came out um, a year or two ago, that has his uh, Brackett's diaries from this time period. There's no mention of malt shops, racetracks. There's no Muggsy Myers. <laughs> um, so what, it's, it's, uh, I still love this movie, even if I've realized it might be a bit of a sham. Um, there was clearly a lot of embellishment going on. Uh, you know, I bet it was Goldwyn's idea to do it. Uh, he, you know, he, I wouldn't put it past him. And I guess the idea was to take Professor Potts's journey into slang that you see in the movie and reflect it onto the screenwriters and give them the same type of story. It's a lesson that you can't always take reported slang at face value. Here's, here's a notorious example from the 90s. So uh, the year was 1992, November 92. You might remember that the grunge scene in Seattle was a big deal. Uh, papers like the New York Times were paying attention. So the New York Times style section had a big spread about, about grunge. And as part of that, a reporter called up the offices of Sub Pop Records and asked a young receptionist named Megan Jasper for some examples of grunge speak. Uh, so this is what appeared in the New York Times. Now, first of all, they misidentify her as working at Caroline Records. She was actually a sub pop, but that wasn't the worst part. Megan Jasper simply made up all of these <laughs> slang terms, every single one. It was, a, it was her protest, apparently, against all of this media attention the grunge scene was getting. But she did an excellent job, I have to say. I mean, these are fantastic, believable. She hoodwinked the Times. And once it became uh, public that this was all made up, um, it became an even bigger deal. And actually, uh, some of these terms actually became popular in a kind of an ironic way. So people really ended up using words like harsh realm, cobnobbler, lame stain. So, you know, and if you, if you look at Urban Dictionary, you might also get the sense of people who just maybe are making up slang for the fun of it to see if people actually end up using their creations. As long as we're in the 90s, I just want to talk about a movie that actually does have genuine youth slang in it that I'm fond of. Okay, so enough of you recognize Cher Horowitz from Clueless, 1995, a classic. Um, perhaps it could be featured here someday, but um, this movie proves that it is po possible to use authentic youth slang, and for this movie, the writer-director Amy Heckerling actually did spend a lot of time with high school kids, and she actually did keep uh, journals of slang terms. She, she did her own kind of field work. I've talked to her about it, I believe her. <laughs> um, and she, not only that, not only did she do her own kind of research, she also relied on some slang research from other people. So there was a 1993 compendium of student slang, 
from UCLA that was edited by a professor there, Pamela Monroe, and she dipped into that. She got some terms from there. Here are three that show up in Clueless. Uh, that you might remember if you know the movie well enough. There's Audi for out of here. Um, Barney is kind of confusingly defined here as either a very nice looking guy or a stupid slash inadequate male. <laughs> Clueless uses the second sense. Uh, Betty for a physically attractive female. And if, it's, you know, if you're thinking of Betty and Barney Rubble from the Flintstones, then the, those make a little sense. Getting back to Ball of Fire. Now, what if um, Brackett and Wilder had really wanted to sort of consult some slang, uh, slang research, uh, some slang scholarship? Where would they have looked? Well, there was a magazine based in Los Angeles called Words, and I think they would have found that interesting, especially um, a column um, that was started in 1937 by a young linguistics professor named Dwight Bollinger, and that was called The Living Language. So Bollinger was interested in uh, new slang and other new words and phrases that hadn't made their way into dictionaries yet, and he kept track of them on a quarterly basis. So in a sense, this is like the real life uh, Professor Potts. Um, and when he was working on that, he, um, he corresponded with H.L. Mencken, the famous journalist and author of the American language. H.L. Mencken was involved with a journal called American Speech. and so. Based on that connection, um, Bollinger ended up moving this column to that journal, American Speech, in April 1941, right when uh, Brackett and Wilder would have been working on Ball of Fire. And it was rechristened. It was called Among the New Words. And Among the New Words is also celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. Uh, it's, it's, it's kept going on a regular basis, and for the past five years, I've been the chief editor of it. Um, and I, I work with my fellow editors, um, Charles Carson and Jane Solomon, on this. And we're still basically doing the same hunt for not just slang, but other sort of new expressions, other neologisms. And our goal is basically the same uh, as uh, Dwight Bollinger's was. Our, but our methods and our sources of evidence have greatly changed, obviously, in the digital era when, you know, the types of things that would be unforeseen by Dwight Bollinger or the, you know, the fictional Professor Potts looking on, say, you know, Facebook or Twitter for, for, uh, for sources of slang and that sort of thing. Um, I'm just going to walk you through one example quickly just to show the way that we deal with slang and hunting down their roots now. I'll just take one slang term, and uh, that is ratchet. <laughs> you might have heard of this one. Um, so, uh, yeah, so one, one of the things I do is um, I'm sort of chair of the American Dialect Society's New Words Committee, so I oversee the Word of the Year selection. And in 2012, uh, this word came up um, as a sort of a popular slang term. Um, and um, originally at that ADS meeting when we were talking about it, it was given a very sort of quick and not terribly uh, nuanced definition. Slang term originally referring to urban divas, now used to mean ghetto. That's a pretty terrible definition. Um, so this word is often explained as originating from a regional um, African-American pronunciation of the word wretched, wretched, ratchet. So uh, in Among the New Words, we treat all of these uh, nominees that uh, people bring up every, every year for, in the word of the year voting. And so we did a number on ratchet. I don't expect you to read all of that. And uh, it's uh, not all the most polite language, that's for sure. We're quoting song lyrics. We're quoting all sorts of different sources. Um, and we're breaking things down into different senses. We've got a couple of adjectives over the top to the extreme, beyond what's socially acceptable. But then also this positive meaning, except, excellent, wildly fun. Um, and then you know nouns uh, for a type of dance that was pop popularized in Shreveport, Louisiana, or the rap music associated with it. And then also a noun for a woman who is, has these uh, particular qualities associated with her. Um, and so there's lots, of, lots and lots of data here. We have almost too much to deal with. Rather than having to go hunt for things, um, you know, searching on databases, on uh, song lyrics, on social media, we get all sorts of things that we then have to corral into a kind of a story about how this word developed. But it can be awfully confusing, and this is a pretty confusing example. Um, you can make it a little less confusing by sort of plotting out all of these different appearances of the word on timelines, showing how the different senses emerged, 
You could also look at the different types of sources that provide the citations. So there's that, uh, there's that song back in 1999 from Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, you know, other songs where it's kind of a local phenomenon. Uh, but then, you know, you get good old Urban Dictionary. So can you trust Urban Dictionary to tell you about slang? Well, take it with a big grain of salt and only in the context of lots of other data, lots of other evidence. But here it actually is helpful in sort of trying to piece uh, how people started using these different senses of this particular slang word. Um, and you know, from there, other places online beyond just this regional usage in Shreveport, Louisiana, it appears in sort of mainstream publications in print and online, um, other songs from other parts of the country, and it shows up on lists of students' slang. So there are, you know, uh, there are professors at different universities doing like what Pamela Monroe did at UCLA, getting their students to uh, compile what slang are kids using now. Um, and then so a word like ratchet, you can actually see, ah, okay, well it started in Louisiana, but here it is at UNC Chapel Hill. Here it is at, you know, Cal State Sacramento. So um, these things can become national uh, very quickly these days. Um, and, you know, in our treatment of all of this, we also get to put in audio clips. So I won't play any for you now, uh, but, uh, but the online version of this would actually include clips of the songs we're talking about so you can hear the evidence. So this is, this is the, the kind of the, the rich data, the rich evidence that we're able to mine these days. And let's just say it's a, uh, it's a long way from... Uh, what we had back in the days of Professor Potts and his real-life counterparts. Okay, well, that's all I have, so please enjoy the movie, and thank you so much again for having me be a part of this.